So in this section, we're going to talk about some specific consideration for peripheral nerve blocks. Really, you should think about nerve blocks for any patient schedule for having arm or leg or any extremity surgery. Most patients can at least benefit from local anesthetic injection around their incision. In the period period, we can use continuous nerve blocks that give long-term pain, pain control. It can be days to even weeks. They can enhance comfort for sleep, rehab, dressing changes, and even transport. These techniques provide the possibility to prolong anesthesia while we can avoid the risk of general anesthesia. Also, after surgery, there is much better analgesia, reduced, pain con uh, reduced opioid consumption, and opioid-related side effects when we use these techniques. There is significant evidence that patients receiving continuous pain relief with regional techniques have a smoother post-op period, better respiratory function, and less morbidity post-operatively. As you can see in the top figure, the nerves of the arm and hand originate in the neck. These nerves form a complicated web of nerves that you can see in the bottom figure, which is the brachial plexus. And as you probably remember, the brachial plexus is formed by the ventral rami of C8 to T1. And this plexus ends in three main nerves of median, radial, and ulnar, which innervate most of your upper extremities. We can block brachial plexus at different levels to provide regional anesthesia to the arm. These are inner scalene. We can we typically use that for shoulder surgery, more proximal surgery, supra and infraclavicular, for arm and for, uh, for uh, arm and forearm surgery, and axillary for the forearm and hand surgery. But we can really do specific, even more distal elbow and wrist blocks for specific nerves to improve patchy brachial plexus block if the block is not perfect. So really, based on the position uh, of where you insert your needle, that's what it's called. So interscaling is between the two scalene muscles right here. Supraclavicular above the clavicle, infraclavicular under the clavicle, and axillary at the axil uh, just at beyond the axillary line. So this is this just showed, shows the pro placement for supraclavicular nerve block, and you can see the probe is right at, parallel to the clavicle. And we want to angle it this way so that we're looking under the clavicle because that would be the easiest spot to hit the nerve and uh, get the easier analgesia. So in this uh, video, you can see where you put the probe right there. The first thing you notice is the subclavian artery. And that's the biggest landmark, followed by your, this uh, white line is either ribs or pleura. And I th in this one, I think this is pleura. Or no, that's the rib. This is the pleura. And your branches of the brachial plexus, uh, really divisions, are at that level, are right next to it. So here we're going a little cephalat. Now we're coming back to the same level. Now going a little more cephalate, you can see one scaling here, the other scaling right here. And if you're doing interscaling, it's going to be kind of like right here. And we're coming back down now. Again, this is the supraclavicular level. You see sub, uh, subclavian artery. The nerves right right there. Subclavian vein is kind of squished right here. And again, you see a nice rib, uh, a nice picture for pleura. And this is a rib. And the way we're going to place their needle, you can see the needle is coming from lateral to medial, parallel uh, the probe, beginning the injection. This guy is doing the injection a little distally because the brachial plexus is right here. And that's not where I would do my injection, so not the greatest view there. But ideally, you want to place your needle right under there. Not sure what, is, what we're doing there. Anyway, you, you get the picture in terms of, you know, the process. You don't need to learn how to do the technique. But that was a nice view for the 
in, uh, for the interscaling injection, you see the anterior and middle scale, or anterior and middle scaling right here, and the brachial plexus is right between these two. If you zoom in, we can see it a little bit better. But again, all right, that was it for the upper extremity. Just jump brief. Uh, we don't need to do no much specific except there are different techniques and depending on where you do your injection there is different uh, result from it. So the lower limb like the upper limb is innervated by nerves that come from spinal cord and for lower limbs it's the lumbar and sacral area as you can see in the figure. The lumbar nerves join to form a lumbar plexus and lumbar plexus give rise to the nerves like femoral and obturator nerve and these nerves innervate the front of the leg. Kind of makes sense. Femoral nerve comes anteriorly, covers the front of the leg. Sacral nerves join to form the sciatic nerve that come out posteriorly and innervate the back of the leg. And to be able to get complete loss of sensation, which we really need to do uh, for surgery if the block is for surgery and we're not going to do a general anesthesia. We typ typically need to block more than one nerve. So just doing a femoral neck nerve is not enough to do a knee surgery. But if we're doing it for post-op pain control, we can typically get away with doing a single shot uh, block of a femoral nerve and you have good pain control, good analgesia for like a total knee surgery or for like an ACL repair. We can do nerve blocks for lower extremity at multiple sites just like the upper extremity. Lumbar plexus block with anterior or posterior approach. It can be at the saphenous nerve, it can be sciatic nerve, it can be popliteal fossa, common perineal, ankle, you get the picture. If there is a nerve, we can block it essentially. <laughs> So let's talk about femoral nerve block. It's one of the more common blocks that we do for lower extremity. And depending on where you do, it, it can be called a doctor canal block if we do it distally. But this is a classic femoral nerve block. And the biggest landmark here uh, at the surface is inguinal ligament that comes from ASIS, the anterior superior iliac spine, and goes to the pubic tubercle. And this is pretty easy to find. And you're going to have your femoral artery. You're going to have your femoral nerve, femoral vein, the lymphatics. That would just go through here. And this is typically the placement for our ultrasound probe. We want it to be parallel to the inguinal ligament. Now in this video, you're going to see the probe placement. Again, it's going to place it uh, parallel to the inguinal ligament. And this is the first thing you see. The biggest landmark is femoral artery femoral vein just deep to it and the nerve right next to it it's a big giant nerve and if you don't see the nerve with the ultrasound you're not in the right place and for this technique ideally we're coming from lateral to medial is trying to optimize the view a little bit here just changing the gain changing the depth putting color flow Doppler on to make sure there are no major blood vessels on our path or what we think is a nerve is actually not a nerve and it could be a blood vessel. So we want to make sure that is not the case. So needle placement again just under the ultrasound probe in plane and this shows the path of the needle and we don't want to go through the nerve. We don't want to put, it on, put the injection on top of the nerve because if we do the injection here once we do the injection then uh, the nerve is going to be pushed down because the fluid is accumulating here. Makes it more difficult. You can do it, but it's not great. But if we do the injection right at the distal end right here, once we do the injection, it's going to push the nerve upwards, and you're going to see this nerve is being surrounded by local anesthetic. And once you do a few of these, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so we did the nerve block. Now what? When we do peripheral nerve blocks, they're really not associated with any major systemic effects. You know, like general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia where you see you know, hypotension, bradycardia, you know, 100 different things happening. You don't really see that with peripheral nerve block because their effect is really local where you did your injection. But there are some differences in postoperative care for these patients like protection of the anesthetized limb and introducing alternate analgesia plans like pain pills, IV pain medicine, once the nerve block is wearing off. If we're 
doing continuous nerve blocks though. We typically use dilute solutions of long acting agents like you know one eight percent bupivacaine. You can see in the table some typical rates for each block. So you do not need to remember these or memorize them. Just five to ten ml an hour is a pretty typical rate that we run for our continuous uh, infusions. And most of the time we've been using bupivacaine. Most people in the world use bupivacaine I, uh, for nerve block infusion, but ropivacaine may be preferable to bupivacaine because it's because it has a relative sparing effect on the motor nerves and its low, uh, lower cardiotoxicity potential. But because of the cost, it's been it's much more expensive than bupivacaine. That hasn't uh, taken off yet, but that may change when you guys start you know, getting into practice. Now, some cent centers even use chloroprocaine, which is the short-acting ester, and uh, they claim that it's safer because of ester metabolism. Uh, ester hydrolysis is the mechanism of its metabolism. So, by the time you know, if you do intravascular infusion, by the time it gets to the heart, it's metabolized. So, the risk of cardiac toxicity goes down quite significantly, and a lot of major pediatric centers tend to use this for their pediatric infusion.